Hello and welcome to the Arlington School Committee regular meeting of Thursday, January 9th, 2020. Uh, we don't have any public participation tonight. Okay. Room's empty. <clears throat> uh, great. So I think Jeff is joining us. I haven't heard from him, but otherwise. And uh, uh, our AEA rep is uh, Juliana Keyes. And we do not have a high school rep yet. Um, so our first item on the agenda is vote FY21 town budget allocation. Mr. Mason. Um, yeah, so I have the memo that's on the desk. It's basically a clear um, network modeling planning committee uh, and um, work with the town to uh, come to uh, a, a budget amount for next year's school budget of 76 million. $30,531. Um, and I, if you have any additional questions, uh, what we need to do is to have you, I would like to recommend to move for the school committee to accept this number and we'll continue to start developing the budget based on this, this figure. And uh, yes, I would just note that that amount represents uh, an increase of about 4.6 million over FY um, 2020 which is a 6.44% increase, um, so it's a quite substantial increase. Correct. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Do we have a motion? Um, move acceptance of the uh, FY12, FY21 town appropriation for the school budget in the amount of seven million seventy-six million thirty thousand five hundred thirty-one. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Op opposed? Opposed. Mr. Hainer is opposed. And no abstentions. Mr. Hainer is opposed. Yeah, one. Dylan's here. Just okay. This is mine. This I'm is here. yours. <laughs> you want to sign All right. Word. Great. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda is the um, our school committee FY21 budget priorities discussion. Uh, so we heard over the last two meetings uh, requests or uh, presentations from the elementary principals, the middle school principals, the high school principal, and from AEA. And this is now our turn to uh, either provide additional uh, requests or um, state within those requests what our priorities are. So I don't know if we want to go in order, or if anybody wants to volunteer to go first. <laughs> Bill, did you want to go first, or should we go around? I'll pass for the moment. Okay. I can go. Sure. In my rush to exit my house, <laughs> I left my notes behind, so I'm having to do this without uh, reference to them. But... Um, I was reviewing the budget request. First, I want to um, applaud what the AEA did in terms of their format. I thought that was very nice. Um, but um, big picture, the things that were resonating with me were the requests um, seen both in the principal's request and in, in the uh, AEA ones for item people related to special education. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I continue to be concerned that our funding for special education is not adequate to service the needs of our populations to the extent that we would like to see them and it's potentially interfering with their achievement um, and things such as um, first personnel um, as outlined. Uh, I can't speak to the chair, to the request for additional chairs, but I would be interested to know, to have more detail about what the caseloads are and how additional personnel would, would change those and what that would mean. Um, the additional training for the BSPs 
sounded like it would be help very helpful. Um, the um, BC, the additional BCBAs also, and then finally, uh, the AEA had a request for an additional school psychologist, and that too, I would like to have more information about what what are some numbers that we can look at, caseload, waiting time, um, inability, you know, inability to serve to to help people. <clears throat> Um, are we at a point where we need that second psychologist? Um, all of those things were the highest on my list as priorities. Um, I am, of course, concerned about our reg regular education students and, and want to see them in appropriate classrooms of appropriate size, but <clears throat> my first mark was the special education. Finally, the other thing that i just, again, like some more information about is for curriculum materials, we had, um, we're hearing requests, and what I realized is that it would be really helpful to have the request broken into whether they're an ongoing thing, you know, are they for, for things that we're going to use every year, um, like workbooks or, or things like that, whether it's a new major curriculum that we'll buy once and have for years, and then uh, subscriptions and stuff. Because when we get a line that says curriculum and there's a big number against it, it's hard to say, you know, sometimes we have other funding sources that we can use for one-off things, but I can't tell how much of things are one-offs. Um, and so that would be something that I'd like to hear. <coughs> Finally, at budget this morning, um, we heard about some work that the administration is undergoing to what they're calling true up the budget to make the budget more accurately match what our needs have been for things such as utility costs. And I would I would like to see that happen. I think we shouldn't be um, budgeting with, by wish, we should be budgeting by what we, ex what we really expect. Um, so. Great, yes, Suze. Um, so I think I echo many, many of the things that uh, Dr. Allison Ampe mentioned, I think that, um, uh, SPED has been an area that has been um, not fully funded in the, previous, in the past few years because we've just had so many kids. We just, you know, it's just, we had so many demands and we continue to have so many demands on our, on our system. But I, but especially uh, looking at the AEA's, um, um, you know, their request and comparing them to the uh, principal's request, uh, you see uh, things like occupational therapy, um, board certified behavioral analysts, and SPED are sort of things that they have in common. Um, uh, one of the things I was really struck by is um, like one very tiny thing is this question about the projectors on the walls, which feels like that's a uh, you know sort of a one-time expense to make sure that we can get, we can mount projectors on every on the wall of the classroom so that there's no tripping. That we should be able to find the money someplace in maybe revolving funds or something because it feels like a you know, that's not a, that's not a yearly expense. Um, materials for the Great Body Shop, this has been a persistent problem that we haven't had materials. I know that we've been retooling how it's being done, and I think um, it's important to, 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 you know, it's important public health um, curriculum that we should support as a district. And if teachers are partly not doing this curriculum because they don't have materials for them, that's, that's a shame, I think. Um, the, the, on the, our upper levels, what we're going to see is a continual surge at the middle school level, and I think that the needs of the middle school need to be prioritized right now. We're likely to not see as much of a jump at the high school level. Um, certainly we're not going to get 100% retention, which is what the assumptions were in the budget request, um, both because we haven't got that in the last few years, and also because we're about to con start construction. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, 
you know, we will get a huge surge of the high school after the building is, is done, so, so we will have to adjust things then, but, um, but it feels like now, to the extent that, that we can, we don't necessarily need to staff for enrollment increases. If there have been deficits that we haven't um, addressed earlier, since I definitely think the high school has been <coughs> under funded, um, we should definitely do that. Um, across the upper levels, um, there's been a discussion about the need for Spanish teachers. I think when you get into language classes, that's particularly problematic to have very large classes. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do think that would be nice to have as priority. And then one more, which is um, in as a reflection of the district's initiatives, um, there's a request for reading teachers. And since if, if this is our big push in the next few years is to focus on early elementary reading, I want to have the staff to support that. That's it. Great. Thank you. Mr. Thielman? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't... I don't really have anything unique to add other than when I look at this, um, when I look at the, all the presentations, and I missed one of them, but I read the information online, the, um, or in the Novus, the thing that I always think about is, is there an area where we feel <clears throat> if we put uh, more resources in in the past, we can move the needle? So if, let's just say for the sake of discussion that um, we felt that we were we wanted to, uh, we wanted to address special education needs and, and there was data to show um, that there are special education students weren't making the progress they were supposed to make. Would it be possible, rather than just do all the piecemeal things we do, would it be possible to make this the year we um, invest more resources in special education, possibly at the expense of resources in another area? Or would it be the year we do something about reading or would it be the year we do something about something else? So rather than just kind of lots of things, that keep us kind of moving along, would there be, would this be a year where you could make, you could move the needle on one of the areas where we're not doing as well as we would like? And I don't have enough, that's what came to mind as I read the materials, mm -hmm. and I don't have enough information to really <coughs> say, but that's how I would approach it myself. Great, Mr. Sugman. Okay, um, <clears throat> I felt really comfortable thought I was hearing this this year uh, it seemed to be a pragmatic and reasonable group of uh, requests from both the uh, AEA and from our leadership team uh, my concerns are of course enrollment growth uh, maintaining services for kids uh, we don't want things eroding um, I, I think that, you know, we have not kept pace with staffing at the high school level. Um, and being in a construction mode may require adjustments to the master schedule and, and some sort of a dance that would require more staffing to compensate for the disruption of the school day as a result of being on a work site. Uh, I'm very sensitive to the need for BCBAs and uh, social workers, so I look favorably on those. Uh, I definitely feel the pain of folks who are having projector issues out there uh, running schools with people wanting to do lessons with the uh, tripping over and not being able to get the uh, technology that they'd, they'd like to use. It's frustrating for teachers who are technologically able, and I think we've asked them to be. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, in looking at the, the asks from the folks who came before us, uh, the, I'd also like to see how the administration would prioritize that in their head so that I can look at it and either say yeah or no or uh, sort it a little differently because I, I don't want to be debating something that's not near the cut point, so to speak. If something that rationally falls below the cut point in the administration's proposal that I think should be higher up or something that's high up that I don't think is as big a priority, that's sort of the discussion we'd have. I, I don't want to get into a situation where we're debating things that we universally agree are sort of at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list. So um, 
I'd like to take another cut of this again after I see priorities. Okay, thank you. Um, Morgan, go ahead. Go I ahead. think for me, the, the two pieces that haven't already been said, I, I um, am not super excited about funding more assistant principals for next year. I think we should do what we had said we were gonna do for this year, which we, I, my understanding is we weren't able to fully hire them, which is fine. So I think whatever our commitment was that we were unable to meet for this year, we should certainly um, take care of that. But I, I, I'm not, I'm not fired up about going much beyond that. Um, I'm concerned about um, making sure that, um, you know, we were asking for a number of SLC teachers, then that didn't come up in this. I really wanna understand why we're not, why we didn't want the 3.0 FTEs for that, that we thought we did when we did the five-year plan. So I, I'm you know, not clear on why that would be the case. I understand we have to make difficult choices, but I don't know that that's where where I would like to see us making those choices. Um, I'm not clear about where the, um, <clears throat> where the elementary librarian situation went because we kind of had a plan for that that was gonna be rolled out. And then in the, the principals didn't, I mean, they kind of talked about it in their thing. It was a little confusing. Um, it was sort of down on page four or five and it wasn't in the sort of big piece. So I'm confused and concerned about where we were going with that. I thought we had an understanding of how that was gonna roll out. And I understand it was hard to hire two. So anyway, I just, I think that those things need just more further conversation. Um, but I, I, you know, I thought it was really impressive. I think that um, I like the way, you know, I like hearing about these needs and I don't think that there's any, you know, I don't think that our feedback at this point at least, or I can only speak for myself, I suppose, is not necessarily judgmental. It's just reacting to what, you know, reacting to what we're hearing. So, and we're early on in this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Hanna, did you wanna go now or no? If you don't mind. Oh, sure. Uh, I just, First off, I'd like to say, thank the administration and the budget subcommittee for all the work that they've mm. done and due diligence. Mm. It's, me, it's you, my annual philosophical difference with the committee and the approach to this. I have always believed that the school committee's job as a representative of the parents and the children is to prevent, present a full educational budget. Let the town meeting accept it or reject <clears throat> it. If they reject it, then we do the cut. I've always felt that we've the, we, this party has done the cut ahead of time. That's the reason I voted against it. I do not want that negative vote to reflect on the work that has been done. I really appreciate all the work that's been done. Thank you. Mr. Smith. I just want to note one, one other thing that didn't come to mind quickly because it's sort of in another frame. Um, Student Opportunity Act is going to require us to come together with the administration and uh, plan and approve uh, a three-year plan uh, that would address uh, any un underperforming group relative to the rest of the population and how we would use funding to address this. And obviously until the 22nd of January, we don't know how much additional money we're going to get from the state or um, uh, what sort of expectations they'd have upon us uh, at the AA, uh, uh, accountability and assessment advisory committee meeting earlier this week uh, the, the folks from the state basically said that for districts who are getting decent amount of money from the uh, the Opportunity Act increases are going to probably will have a long form document to fill out and the ones who don't get a lot of money out of this and don't have high needs will get a short form document. So I don't know what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of the budget priorities, we're going to need to ensure that anything that we want to talk about in that plan is reflected within the budget priorities. And so that just is, is a point to mention that I think that we are, are, are looking at underserved populations and ELL students uh, and other populations uh, uh, that we would direct funding to or if we're looking to reduce uh, discrepancies in discipline among ethnic groups uh, that we might want to go and target some funding to some support BCPA uh, or uh, 
social workers directly at that core component. So when, when we start to look at priorities coming back from the administration, uh, it's also my expectation that, that we also have that in context of what the state uh, expects from us and what they're giving us uh, uh, under the uh, provisions of the Student Opportunity Act. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, so my turn. Uh, I did write my down down my priorities, and I'll send to Karen and mm -hmm. copy you guys mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, uh, I did actually have an additional note that uh, this all is in the context of developing the Student Opportunity Act plan. I agree with Mr. <coughs> Schlickman that um, that plan does require a focus on the achievement gap, um, and a lot of the requests uh, just for additional classroom teachers, for example, may may not fit in with that. So we do have to take that into account as we proceed in parallel with those two mm -hmm. two items. Um, so my first priority is, is though, addressing enroll, enrollment growth. We have to do that. Mm -hmm. Our formal projections, though, are significantly smaller than what some of the administrators were using, as, as um, someone previously mentioned. Um, so again, we have 99, uh, an increased projected of 99 students district-wide, not the 105 at the high school. So we were projecting 16 at the elementary schools, 22 at Gibbs, 36 at OMS, and 31 at the high school, so that allows me to support the following. Um, you know, I do think the, the, the reserve teachers is a good concept. Um, given the small increase at the elementary schools that we're projecting, um, hopefully we, will, we won't need all of them, but our kindergarten number is our most uncertain number, so it's prudent to have those reserve teachers. And the distribution of sections across the schools um, may require us to use, you know, one or two of those, perhaps all three, um, but hopefully we can reallocate them uh, uh, in the spring to other pressing needs. Uh, I support the small additions at Gibbs, given, given their increase. I support the half learning community at Audison and the other partial, partial positions, given, given their increase. And at the high school, you know, using the formula of 1.7 FTE per 25 students, that only results in an increase of 2.1 FTE at the high school. Uh, given their prior enrollment growth that may not have been fully addressed, uh, I can support a higher increase, maybe four FTE, with one of those FTE going to the special education COTOC classes that was in the request. And uh, then on top of that, if we, need to, if we do need the construction security person, then we should, you know, we, we have to fund that. My second priority overall is the math intervention program at the elementary schools. I think it's vital both as a matter of equity and to, improve our, and, and to improve on the achievement gap, that we spread the math intervention program from our Title I schools to all our schools. And I also support <coughs> the additional reading teachers requested for similar reasons. My third priority is, with, along with some of my fellow committee members, is supporting special education improvements, again, to address the achievement gaps and also address the issues identified in the lab inclusion review. Um, this includes upgrading the SLC teaching assistant positions to BSPs, providing enhanced training to all BSPs, funding the additional elementary learning specialists, the OMS special education educator, and I'm actually hoping, along with some of my other members, for additional requests that we might hear um, as the, 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 the budget is more fully developed. And then a final priority is that bridge program at OMS. I think that would be a wonderful thing to get started there. So you'll understand that low on my list, along with Ms. Morgan, is the assistant principals at the elementary schools. Um, I appreciate that you felt a full-time one was needed at Stratton in light of the large SLC program, and I understand it's difficult to hire for these part-time positions. Um, but there are other models you can look at. There are other towns that split an assistant principal between school, two schools in Needham. Um, uh, Dr. McNeil, I'm sure, is familiar with it. The assistant principal is both uh, and a half-time assistant principal and a special ed coordinator. So there are other things that we can try. I just, I'm not ready to move to full-time assistant principals at, at all, all of our elementary schools at this time. So, that's my comments. Thank you. Any, anything else anybody want to add? All right, great. So next we have the district data bank presentation. Dr. McNeil.
So good evening to everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, so I'm going to speak about our data bank, which has come up in conversations in the past, especially when we talk about MCAS and the way that we're collecting assessment results. Um, and I just want to point out that the PowerPoint that, and the slides that I'm going to use today were developed by Susan Bisson, our digital learning, our director of digital learning. She could not be here tonight, but I just can't uh, thank her enough for her role um, in helping to make this possible. Um, so when I first arrived here in Arlington, uh, I had conversations with Dr. Bodie, and I also spoke to my predecessor about plans to have an online tool that would collect the various assessment results uh, that um, from uh, for students during you know from the formal assessment periods that take place throughout the year, and um, we've gone through many different iterations. We've talked to different vendors, and we landed upon a very uh, an excellent format uh, that allows us to customize it uh, for what we need. And it's um, the the consultant that we work with. His name is Paul Minuti, and um, it's we call it the Arlington Data Bank, and it's based upon uh, Excel spreadsheets. And um, as you can see here, some of the bullets. The background is that we had, and the reason <coughs> for the data bank is uh, prior to having the data bank, teachers were taking their assessment results and they're putting it on various uh, Google spreadsheets. But there wasn't one source where you could see all the information at, in one place. And so it was very difficult to compare uh, the various assessments results for a particular students. And you couldn't disaggregate it um, by race or ethnicity or, you know, based upon the fact that students are in an IEP, 504 plan, gender. So the data bank has allowed us to do all of that and also it gives you like school, school views and you can look at district results as well. So um, we wanted an online platform. We had one uh, that we were considering before I arrived, but as I said before, we went through many different vendors in order to decide whether or not they could meet our needs. And I, as I talked about before, it's based upon Google Sheets, and we decided also to use this particular platform because it's using Excel spreadsheets, which is something that teachers were already familiar with, so the professional development that would have to take place was very minimal. And we wanted to take that in consideration uh, because we didn't want to bring something entirely new that would um, require teachers to learn a whole new system. So we searched for the new solution and then we landed up on the analytics platform and data studio. Uh, right now, um, over the past couple of years or since I've been here, it seems so long ago now, but <laughs> it's 2017 I think I arrived. Um, we focus primarily on the K-5 literacy assessment data that we collect throughout the year. And it, in fact, we're actually going through a formal assessment period right now. Um, so teachers are working on giving the assessments. They're giving the iReady assessment as well as we speak. Uh, incorporated into the data bank are the district assessment scores that we collect the MCAS scores, our iReady scores. We also include demographic information uh, and any other type of, and, and we're considering also using it to collect behavior information. So we're, we're taking it and we're trying to adapt it to also to the middle school and we've been talking about what that would look like. So as I talked before, you can, you can get uh, assessment results, you can get dist district views and school-based views. So the rollout has been an iterative process. Uh, last year, um, the model that we have right now is distinctly different from what we were using last year because of the feedback that we got from teachers. Uh, we've been talking to groups of teachers along the way in order to make sure that we customize it and it would fit their needs. You know, some of the priorities that we've uh, thought about is, is it easy to use and is it going to uh, place a lot of extra 
responsibilities on the teachers in order to enter their scores. So we wanted something that, you know, is quick, is easy, and that they can also access it. Um, and so we have uh, the different individuals or groups of staff that uh, have access to the uh, data bank, which would be the reading coaches and teachers, principals, administrators, the math coaches, and general education teachers and special education staff. So here is, I know it's kind of hard to see, but here is what it looks like. And um, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't bring in an actual uh, view of it because we don't want to expose student names or their scores, so student information. So in order to protect those, that information, we have blurred out the student names, and this is actually the view of a kindergarten, what it looks like for kindergarten. And as you can see, and I wish I had a walking mic because I wouldn't want to walk up and tell you, but I think I have a pointer here, right? Okay, here's a pointer. So here, as you can see, uh, the way that you use it is if you go up here, and maybe you can see it better on your computers, but you see here you have a drop-down screen. If you click this on this particular line right here, you'll, you'll get a mm -hmm. list of grades. Uh, and if you want to access those grades, a particular grade, you just click on that grade, and then it come. And the information that you're look that you're looking for will appear. Right here um, is the name, as you can see, the grade level that you're looking at. Right here is a scoring guide and help page. Uh, we included rubrics and also information on how to utilize the uh, data bank. So there's instructions in there, and there's also um, the various rubrics for the MCAS, the iReady, and also other assessments that we utilize so that teachers can interpret the scores. Right here is the way that you can disaggregate it. You can filter the scores. We have if students are ELL, identified as ELL, identified as, uh, or, or they're on an IEP, or if there's a, they're on a 504 plan, uh, uh, looking at it, we can disaggregate it by gender and we can disaggregate the scores by ethnicity. Uh, right here is a key. Uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that on all the assessments there was a common uh, language as it relates to students meeting the benchmark, not meeting the benchmark, or partially meeting the benchmark um, in order to align it with our MCAS terminology. And as you go across here, these are the different ways that you can manipulate the information. So right here, if, you, if you're looking to see the percentage of students that are meeting, partially meeting, or not meeting, it's reflecting the, what you have uh, searched for, the information below. So this is going to reflect what's here, you know, showing up down here below. If you are looking to disaggregate it and look at how a and, and you want to compare how your class does on a particular assessment, the percentages of students that are meeting, partially meeting, and not meeting, and you want to compare it to how the school does, you can, you can <coughs> um, filter the scores right here, and you can identify the assessment you would like to you know, look at in particular, and then you put in your school name. And then it will also have the district percentages right here. So a teacher is able to compare their class based upon you know, whatever assessment they're looking at to how the, the school is doing and how the district is doing, okay? And so we thought that that was you know, very useful to teachers. Now down here, um, you can also further disaggregate the scores if you wanna look up a particular student, uh, a particular school, a particular <coughs> teacher, a particular student, uh, you can, um, right now, if you, if you were to scroll down, you would see all the assessments right here, the names of the assessments, and then the score, and then whether the green means that the students are meeting the benchmark, a yellow would mean they're partially meeting, and a red would, would mean that they're not meeting. Um, and if you wanted to just hone in on a particular assessment and you wanted to just look at the MCAS scores, right here is the way that you can do that. Um, and then right here is the benchmark. If you just want to look at all the kids in a particular subgroup that are not meeting the benchmark, 
you can disaggregate it that way as well. So although we blurred out the, the, out the names here, but we have, you can look at the, t the teacher names, the columns that are represented here is the teacher name, the student name. Um, now this is the gender of the student, the ethnicity of the student, there's a list of the assessments, and this is the score. And then this is the category, um, how this particular student um, scored on that particular assessment. I'm gonna stop right now for any questions. Yes. Just real quick, who ha is this is already in place? Yes. Who has access to all this information? So there's different uh, access levels of access. Okay, you've answered all my questions then right. on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have the same question. <laughs> so, um, so when you look at an individual student, mm -hmm. um, does the teacher and then the administrators have access to that student data? Do, does the entire school have access to that student's data? So what, you know, what, what level of access would right, so, somebody have to an individual student, for example? So in order to, and, and this is the complicated, whoops, back, went back. So right now there's two levels of access. There's district access and there's school access. Okay. The teachers in a particular school have access to the data within their school. To everybody. Right. Okay. And then the principal naturally has access to the, you know, information in their school. If you're a district uh, administrator, uh, a reading coach, uh, a math coach, a director, a curriculum leader, you have access to the entire district. And may I? Um, so um, do teachers have concerns that um, they are then going to be evaluated by their fellow professionals so that, you know, it's very clear if one teacher is excelling compared to another one because of the assessment data? Is that, is that a concern that teachers ha have expressed? Well, this is where the level of trust for me is very high. I do not have that concern okay, because uh, when, I, when we sent out, we had a lot of conversation about confidentiality and we asked teachers to only, if you're looking at, if you're looking, using the data bank, only go into your classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's also useful for students, I mean, for teachers who want to have, like we have the ACE blocks now and they wanna look at a grade level, mm -hmm. the data for a grade level, it gives them that type of access. Um, we're going to continue to work to see how we can pare down the access, but right at this particular point in time, just like I said, it was an iterative, iterative process. Right now, it, this is the level of access that we can work with, mm -hmm. and we're in, because this is something brand new. This whole um, data bank has Sorry. actually been developed along the way, so this is something that's new. Um, it's we also uh, Paul Minuti, who is our consultant that we work with. Um, he's very responsive, and we have other districts that are also using this platform. Mm -hmm. And so he has like he has d meetings throughout the year. They, he calls them knowledge shares, mm -hmm. and so we meet and we talk about you know, how they're using the data bank and different ways that you know I, I might see another district and say, hey, you're really using it for this and and for this particular assessment, and and so it gives us ideas on how to mm -hmm. continue to have it evolve uh, so that we can um, make it more uh, dynamic. So it, it sounds very exciting. It sounds, um, especially for professionals who are working with many students within a, a you know, school or the district, um, to be able to have access to what's going on with that student sounds like a really valuable thing. Mm -hmm. um, my final concern is about um, making sure that this data is safe and protected. Right. So that's the beauty of this. Um, this is, that was another priority of ours, mm -hmm. is that we're not sending this out to a third party. Mm -hmm. All the data that we're using is collected on the uh, Google Sheets, so it's our data, mm -hmm. and it's just represented here. So it doesn't go anywhere. It's, it's in, in the, the cloud. cloud. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's in the cloud, yeah, okay. Right, so, but it doesn't go to like a third party vendor. Right, right. Which if we were to use another so platform. So Google is, somebody can tap into Google, they can get it, but that's, but not, Correct. right, but okay. Right. Okay. But it does it. But there's not another third-party vendor that's looking at our student right. data, right. Uh, and and they don't. There's no one a third-party vendor that has access to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Ms. Morgan. Um, <coughs> I think this is outstanding, and I it, it looks really beautiful on these slides. But I suspect there's a, was a really big lift behind getting this going um, that we can't even appreciate in the the short conversation we have. I think, you know, for me, 
what I hope as a as a parent of multiple elementary children, the, the place where I feel a little bit uncomfortable is that the, that this represents aggregated data about my children that I don't always have access to, right? So I, I get their MCAS scores, um, but we don't always get their assessment data. And I understand, like, you know, I, I, it's certainly more complicated than I'm going to make it out to be in my short remarks. But, um, you know, I know that, that my kids take these iReady tests on the regular at school. I never get those results. I, oh, well, I do because my kids tell me they take them and then I email their teacher and ask them to send them to me, which they do, which is great. But, but um, I do feel uncomfortable that, that this kind of data about my kids is being, um, is being aggregated and we're not yet at a place where we're able to, to figure out a reasonable and appropriate and productive way to share that with parents. And I, I think, you know, as this process evolves and as you become, you know, certainly we're not going to have parents logging into this necessarily, but as you, as this um, evolves and matures, I hope that at some point part of the conversation will be of this, you know, now that we have a way for our district to look at this assessment data, you know, which, what of this beyond what's already on our report cards is also appropriate to share with parents. It's all appropriate to pair, share with parents. The, I, I guess my, my theme around sharing with parents is I don't want to make it about the assessment. I want to make it like a bigger holistic view of how your child is doing. This is one data point. Mm -hmm. To me, I mean, if a child is struggling, you can take this and triangulate it with, you know, authentic student work that they're, they're completing in the classroom. You can look at it in, in relationship to attendance. I mean, you can take these assessment points and it gives you a way of being <coughs> curious about a particular student, you know, if they're excelling and if they're not excelling, then this can, you know, spark that curiosity. Say, I wonder why, you know, Rod isn't doing as well as he's, you know, should be as his peers. Mm -hmm. And um, I just got a flashback moment there. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, just looking at that data and then that then teachers now at the elementary level have the ace blocks where now they can hone in and say, okay, let's get some work samples that Rod has produced in, in math or in reading and let's see what's going on here. And so this is, this is not the, you know, this is just one data point. And I want to I stress that to parents because I don't want them to now hone in on how they're doing on one particular assessment. It's a snapshot that can be utilized to develop a more holistic picture of any individual student as a learner. So they're more than welcome during a parent-teacher conference or emailing the, the teachers say, hey, I know that you just, you know, my child came home, they said they just took these assessments, can you just let me know how they did? Or is there a concern? And then, you know, the conversation can, you know, go from there. I just don't want the assessment, I don't want the conversation to be about the assessment because these are checkpoints along the year, right? This, these are like progress monitoring tools that we're seeing how students are doing throughout the year and allows us to make real-time adjustments in our instruction if we see that something is awry. It's not, it's not a summative uh, assessment. These aren't summative assessments, they're formative assessments. And they provide actually more value than the MCAS because once you get the MCAS data back, that cohort of students have moved on. Mm -hmm. So we really want to focus on being able to provide teachers with information that can inform their instruction in real time. And so that's, that's how this is being utilized. Um, so right here is just a you know, uh, more uh, close-up view of one of the, of, the, of the top part of the data bank. And um, so as I, as I spoke about this before, this is where the teacher could compare how there's the students in his or her classroom is performing on a particular assessment based, you know, and compared to the school and to the district. Um, and so this is more, I, I spoke about the filters that we can utilize to disaggregate the data. And this is the, you know, uh, you know, the, get the school view, the teachers can use it for their classroom. Um, and you, you can pull it up by individual student. You can look at an individual assessment. 
And you can pull up a couple of assessments and say how they've done in that particular assessment. And it also gives you uh, information about the benchmark of where the student should be at that time of the year. Uh, this is a scoring guide and help page that is a link on the data bank that teachers can access. Um, and then um, this is more information about how we've collected information from teachers. Uh, and we have a page that teachers can utilize to ask questions and or to ask for more information. And this also gives us feedback to see what we need to do as we continue to uh, refine and make the data bank more dynamic. Um, and, and, you know, as we talk about, you know, the question is always when we collect data is like, what do we want to know about students? And that's another uh, thing that, I, that makes the data bank so valuable is if we decide that we, we have found another assessment or we want to adjust our assessments like we've done in first grade, we can do that in real time on the data bank. We don't have to go to a third party vendor to do that. We can make it, we can customize it to collect and display any type of information that we want. And so the conversations that we, that are ongoing is like, or what revolves around what type of information <coughs> is valuable to teachers and inform their instruction. And so they have a big part in providing that feedback. Um, right now, uh, as we speak, we're looking at adding um, the social studies common assessment and the science common assessment to the data bank. So we're having to, we're pil actually piloting those various common assessments with teachers and getting their feedback and then understanding um, and then talking with Paul how that's gonna be represented in the data bank along with math. And we're, and we're looking at like ways that we can use it uh, at the secondary level as well. So that concludes my presentation. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Hanna, did you have one before? Or? Just curious, who inputs the data? Do the individual teachers as they complete an assessment? Yes, so um, the teachers all receive a link to a spreadsheet and then that spreadsheet, in that spreadsheet they input their data and then it goes into a master spreadsheet, and then it's organized into the data bank. Just one more. Is, is this helpful, making the reports for the state? The, 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 all, there's, there's a lot of state information, mm -hmm. looking for how many 504s, how many, uh, the different testing and stuff like that. Are you able to take this information, just send it to the state, or do you have to? Do so that's a very good question. So that type of information comes from PowerSchool. Okay the SIMS reports and those type of information that comes from the power school. And that's actually where we get the information for the data bank. Okay. Thank so you. we can utilize the, you know, demographic information, gender, uh, whether or not a student is on an IEP, has a 504, all that information is coming from power school. Um, so the iReady assessments, so those are online, right? Does yes. That, does, that, does that still require Rekeying the data, or is that somehow connected so that they don't have to actually re and input the data? So that's a great question. So the teachers don't have to do that for the iReady. What <laughs> happens is because the iReady is an online assessment, I can take the C CSV file, the Excel spreadsheet, send it to Paul, and then tell him to input it into the data bank. And is are we and training it, someone in house to be able to do that, or are you going to rely on Paul for sort of that kind of support? We can. I mean. Um, you know, as we're talking about budget here, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I would love to have a uh, data person for the district, but that would be something down the line, I think. Uh, right now, I think this is working, and I know that we have other priorities to tend to, but if, you know, my vision is like maybe five years down the line, we do have an assessment and data analyst for the district, that that's what they do. Great. And right now, we do have somebody within the district. Paula O'Sullivan is a math coach, but she also uh, works as, uh, she also is a data coach as well. Great. Um, so when you, when you said you're adding assess, additional assessments, Paul is sort of doing that setup, right? Right. So um, in fact, I just read an email today where uh, Denny Conklin, our um, director of social studies, is, is working with Paul to develop because when you, when, you, when you talk to Paul, we, we want to know, okay, it's, we, we have this assessment, and we have, we have a rubric, but then if we put in a value, what does that mean? 
right? Because we want the information that we put into the data bank to mean something to the teacher. So if they look at that score, what does that mean? And so what we can do is we can, as it, and the help page and the, um, the help page that I showed you, the guide and the help page that teachers can access, we can put the rubric on there. So if you see that value, go to the rubric that's on the help page and you can be able to determine, you know, how that is broken down. And then you can, you can break it down in different categories. So that could be another dashboard for the social studies and you can have different uh, segments of that rubric and then you have a holistic score and you can have it broken down by the various um, areas that you're gonna use to analyze that person, that, that, that student's uh, assessment. A really short question. Sure. Do you have any historical data in here or is it just from like 1920? Like could, can, can you go in arrears at this point or yes, no? Yes, we can go back one year because oh. we started developing this last year. But right, and then it'll just carry forward. Correct. Cool. Okay. Right. 1920? School year. Oh, oh 19 slash 20. Um, so I would just echo Ms. Morgan's comment that some thought needs to continue to be given as to what information to share with parents. I mean, I, but we should we should announce that we have this wonderful data bank because it's a good it's, it's a good thing to let people know. But I think then people are going to be curious. Well, is my student in there in the red? Right? Is you know? Not well, I mean, my hope and I I believe this wholeheartedly is that teachers have those conversations throughout the year. You know, I, I believe and I trust our teachers and they work very hard to make sure that they communicate with parents and because we have the parent-teacher conferences. So, you know, I know for a fact that teachers are having those conversations. Now, whether or not parents know that the data bank is there, again, that could be something that we, I definitely can work on in order to market it to parents and let them know that we are us utilizing it and then, you know, so they, they know. Uh, what questions to ask during the yep. parent-teacher conference. Uh, so I actually, I worry about sharing it or too much with parents because I, I would worry about a parent of a student who's in the light green, say, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, over, getting over worried about that, right? So, so not something that teachers really see as a major concern, but maybe just a little dip or something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes parents, mm -hmm. you know, get, very concerned about things that well, teachers aren't concerned about. So I, I just sort of worry about that, about, in, about looking at that data, te uh, parents looking at the data without context mm -hmm. and without discussion. Yeah. Right, so um, and like, that's, that, that's what I'm saying. So I, I know that teachers are communicating with parents right. along the way throughout the year so they can share those scores with them. Um, but, you know, I, you know, it could be valuable if we let this, the, the parents know, like, during these particular times during the year, these are the formal assessment periods that we have throughout the year, and this type of information helps us to understand your child as a learner. And we use it as a progress monitoring tool, to, to your point, so that we don't cause panic or if there's a dip. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, again, we don't want to focus solely on the assessment. We want the, I want the information I want parents to understand that these are progress monitoring tools just as they would give a quiz, mm -hmm. right, in the class or, or a, a unit test or, you know, they have homework that they get back from students. They utilize all that information in order to understand how a student is progressing. So all that are data points that go along with the assessment scores. Mr. Sigmund? Yeah, I mean, I, I concur with Dr. Seuss uh, on her point in that th this is data that teachers should be using to plan instruction and as an interpretive tool. In an ideal world, what we're doing is then having the teacher concatenate this and combine the statistical data that is in the package with the actual observations of the student in other uh, uh, work that the uh, teacher sees being produced by the child to be interpreted in such a manner that, that the report card or other parent reports on a regular basis are accurately portraying the, uh, the progress of the child. Uh, I mean, uh, some parents are statistically savvy 
probably the most statistically savvy parent in the uh, district is sitting to my right. Mm -hmm. So that, yes, so the parents who understand the psychometrics underneath this and want to see it, that's certainly appropriate. But in terms of uh, making meaning to parents, that interpretive focus through the uh, report card and parent uh, communications is really the most important way to go about it. I, I, and I agree with you. I, I don't, but I don't want to give the, I also don't, along with Ms. Morgan's uh, point, as I don't want parents to think that we're, collect, we're collecting data and we're keeping it from them, right? right? I, yeah. I, and I think there's a balance that we can yeah. strike so that, you know, parents understand that this, exactly what you said. Like, this is something that we're collecting throughout the year, and, you know, hopefully this is part of, like, substantive conversations that are ongoing throughout the year, so, you know, parents do have that context uh, in order to take into consideration when they, when they think about the progress of their students. I, th I think just for me, the analogy is like if I took my kid to the pediatrician and they had a temperature of 99.5, mm -hmm. right? And like the 99.5 is sure. the number, right? But like the important conversation is what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. Oh, are we worried at 99? Can I send them to school? Well, exactly. Like, can I send them to school? Right. Yeah, you can, but just keep an eye on them, you know? So I think, um, but, but I still as a parent want at some point in some context that's, mm -hmm. that's appropriate to, you know, I still have access to the 99.5 too, right? And I can say, okay, that, you know, kind of works in my system, but then to your point, the broader conversation about what that, you know, temperature or blood pressure, or whatever means in the broader concept of context of what we're looking at is really right. the most important piece. I'm, I'm sure so. we can strike a balance between having the proper amount of communication with this. Great. All right, thank you. A lot of a lot of great progress. Any other comments? No, it was a great yeah. verb that Paul used, concatenate. <laughs> I love that word. Uh, I had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> no. I dropped that word on the literacy coordinator in Lowell once, and she had to look it up. Oh. And she's an incredibly brilliant woman who knew more words than anybody ever knew. And the fact that she had to look that up, I thought was a moral victory for the House statistician to uh, to uh, put one over on the uh, literacy coordinator. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you Great. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. All right. Next we up we have the superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. Thank you. I have a few things, and I'll start with um, the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already talked uh, back before the holidays about the process we went through and the results of, of looking at value engineering. I will reiterate that this is actually a process that we're going to continue over the next four to five years as, as we move through this project. Um, what has been going on since then is our architects are preparing the documentation that needs to be sent to MSBA, and I believe it's probably going to be submitted this is the design number in the budget, um, if not tomorrow, early next week. But mm -hmm. while even that's going on, uh, a lot of work is continuing. There's been uh, meetings about the parameter in terms of things, both that are the timetable in terms of uh, improvements that have to go on there in order for us to stick with our timeline. Uh, we had a couple hour meeting this afternoon on transition issues and there are a lot of transition issues that have to be dealt with a lot of detail in terms of uh, moving forward not only with the preschool moving out but um, just even things about w pathways that are going to be lit what's the timetable um, how are you going to enter the building uh, what are going to be evacuation routes the, the list goes on and on um, but this is something that is part of the process, and we, um, we definitely need to, to move forward with all of this. Uh, one of the things that we will probably get fairly soon is just have a high-level look at some of the more uh, detailed um, transition issues that we need to take a look at. I mean, it gets down to the nitty-gritty of where we're we going to store the preschool furniture for a month. I mean, that, that's the level that it has to be at in order for everything to move very smoothly. Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of conversations continue and will continue uh, all the time. Uh, 
I know that as we move forward, and the, the building committee knows, is that the uh, parents and the community want to know progress reports, essentially. Where are we? And we have an, another community forum mm -hmm. scheduled um, on Feb Tuesday, February 4th. It's going to be here at the high school. I'm not sure yet if it's going to be the auditorium or old hall, but it's going to be here at the high school. And um, it's scheduled at 7 o'clock mm -hmm. to 8.30. It is an opportunity for, um, I think, probably more focus for parents of students at uh, Otteson, Gibbs, and the high school to hear about um, the timetables, the, the, some of the issues around transition. The principal presenters, I, clearly it would be the architect in terms of where we are with design, but it will also be um, our contractor, Consigli, talking about um, uh, various things that, where we are in the process. So, we go forward, and it's, it's very good. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad to hear we're doing a forum. I am impressed by the number of people who were engaged by the conversation over some of the uh, value engineering, and most frequently, not exclusively, but most frequently in terms of the geothermal. Mm. Uh, and this is not my area of expertise. I was not in on the conversation, so I was not able to do more than a cursory explanation of where we are. And a couple of people mentioned that they'd like to, you know, we had all these community forums in the past. Can we have something over this issue? Because this seems important. Uh, so given the community interest in the geothermal and the sustainability of the building, uh, and the changes that we're making and the choices we're making, uh, some sort of a forum or a, a way to more effectively communicate to the community exactly what choices were made and why we thought they were reasonable choices, mm -hmm. I think would be a, a good thing to do. Well, I, well, I, I don't know if Dr. Yeah. Allison. Yeah. So uh, I can speak to that. <laughs> um, so we actually have a blog in a blog in progress. It'll actually probably turn out to be two: one explaining decisions made, um, the other explaining sustainability in depth. Um, one thing that is important to realize is that there was not a significant. Uh, there was a small, but quite small difference in the sustain in in our ability to meet sustainability goals with the switch from all geothermal to partial geothermal so it, it didn't you know I think when people are concerned they're thinking that we're going from here to down mm -hmm. here and it was it was like here to like there um, this will be more in depth um, and we're working it's been partially written we're in the mm -hmm. process of, of mm -hmm. uh, editing it now um, the forum, first I want to say that it is open to community members too, mm -hmm. and also that one of the reasons we're holding a forum now is that what's called pre-work, so work mm -hmm. in advance of the major construction mm -hmm. project, will begin very soon. Um, after, mm -hmm. or is it during February break or, or yes, after? during February break it yeah. starts. It's actually so going to start mobilizing a little before that too. So that's mm -hmm. things like fences are going to be going up, mm -hmm. um, traffic patterns are going to be, I mean, foot traffic patterns are going to be changing. All of these things are going to be discussed at the forum. Um, and I think we can, uh, I don't have the list here in front of me of what all were mm -hmm. being discussed, but I think we can at least talk mm -hmm. a little bit about sustainability. Right. I think, I think at the forum will be also an opportunity for us to hear as a committee some of the issues that have come up. In fact, it was an email that was sent after that process mm -hmm. that uh, caused the communications subcommittee. Actually, it was the person who has been chairing a sustainability subcommittee, Ryan Kotowski, to say, I need to write a blog about this so mm -hmm. people understand it. As Dr. Allison Ampey said, it was very informative to the committee to find out that the, the effect of reducing the geothermal wells was minuscule um, in terms of 
um, the sustainability goals. And um, so, but there was a strong commitment to maintain this. So I don't, I think that it may have been communicated by the, no, the sheer number that we dropped that there was gonna be a change in those goals. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not the case. But the, the geothermal wells, that's something that's going to happen this spring, for example, and a, a, a fair number of them are going to be over on the, the old practice field. Mm -hmm. And so all of that work has to occur before that practice field, for example, gets paved over. So that's gonna be one of the principal parking areas for the high school uh, during, well, dur not only during the phasing, but also beyond that too. There are things, it's really helpful to hear, because today we were doing, I had just a long, long list of things that need to be attended to. But it's really good when people think of things because mm -hmm. when they do, it's helpful to us to make sure that that's something that we address. Um, we have a, you know, we have a large enough committee that there's enough ideas that are popping up, but I'm sure there's, as we go along, I say, oh, I forgot about that. And, it's helpful, very helpful. Yeah, I mean, two things I want to, you know, we're not, this is going to be a highly energy efficient building. It's going to be a much different feel than mm -hmm. what we have right now. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be consistent with best practices across the state. And we're still going to have geothermal wells, but this is a very complex site to put mm -hmm. geothermal wells on. <clears throat> mm -hmm. People need to realize that it's a very complex site. And, and you know, the more we learned about it, the more complex it, it is. Yeah. I think part of it is we don't have local reporters anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, those discussions that you had that I saw, some of them at the mm -hmm. building committee meeting that covered this, mm -hmm. had we had a reporter there, yeah. this would have gotten out. None of this got out, so now yeah. you have to do it. Yeah. And once that gets out, I think that'll answer a lot of the questions. Yeah. And if mm -hmm. people have still have more questions, yeah. you know, they, mm -hmm. know, they know who to contact. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we did craft the news release to try and address this, but I think people just didn't pick up on that, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I heard is about the, the, the ramp, you know, to the, the bike path, and people don't realize that it was going to cost $600,000, mm -hmm. right? When I tell them that, they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's and, why. Yeah, there you was, a, there was a, a mistaken impression that some people had that somehow this building was not going to be handicap accessible because we moved the, lamp, the ramp, and that's not true. Yeah. And had people come, had, had there was, if there was a reporter on the ground covering our discussion, that would have been clear. Mm -hmm. you do, you're doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. If questions come up, you're addressing them. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Next. Oh. Oh. I mean, this is, a, this is a very complicated topic. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of very smart people with a lot of expertise in the community. And so it's very easy to start getting questions from people mm -hmm. who yeah. are within their niche and domain that us generalists uh, who don't have an expertise in uh, modern building construction and sustainability are, are, aren't really able to answer. Uh, I, one of the things I say is that we have really impressive people on this building committee so that when the decisions are made, I have a whole boatload of faith that the folks on this committee are doing the right thing and are doing this for a logical and a justifiable reason. That I can't explain why is just because the answer is beyond the scope of what I can do uh, at this point uh, in terms of answering technical questions. So the more we get out, the better, because you know, I, I, I don't know construction. Great. <laughs> well, it's the, that time of year again where we're begin, going to be getting kindergarten registration. And the letter that um, explains the process and what we're gonna do about buffer zones ha will be posted on the website, if not right now, it's being posted tomorrow. Um, it's, we don't have potential kindergarten parents' email address, so it's something we can't uh, necessarily send out, but we're going to have copies in the elementary schools, and, and, and I, I think it would be appropriate even to send it to some elementary parents because we have siblings. But the, the important, uh, I'm not gonna repeat everything that's in this letter, it's four pages long, uh, but it is as comprehensive and as clear as we could possibly make it. 
The registration begins uh, January 22nd at 6 a.m. The thing that's important to understand, this is the, the anxiety about registration <coughs> is um, about after school programming, and I'll talk about that in a second, and also uh, choices of, for buffer zones. Everyone that registers between the 22nd and the 28th of January will be in the same equivalency in terms of a date for buffer zones. Uh, and one that January 28th comes and goes, we will be work, working to, uh, to, to make decisions about buffer zones. And people that had registered in that window will receive their buffer zone assignment by February 5th. Be busy first week of February. But then after that, as registrations continue to come in, and they will, and they will open even until beyond the first day of school, um, we'll try to do everything within a two week window. Anybody who registers in February, I want to get those assignments done by the end of February because um, all parents who put in their application for after school mm -hmm. uh, programs will be on equal footing with everybody if they have it in by 6 o'clock on the 2nd, and that's in the letter. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank uh, Jennifer Seuss because really it was with her leadership this year. We have an agreement among all of our after-school programs about the, the, the process for timing. That's been one of the sources of anxiety for mm -hmm. parents, that I have to put an application into two schools because I don't know which one I'm going to be in. And so we've tried to just eliminate that, that anxiety and that issue. And um, so I think that all the parents coming in will be very appreciative of this agreement that we have. I have to say the after school programs were very cooperative and they very, were. And they very were terrific. understanding and I, mm -hmm. you know, I appreciate mm -hmm. their effort, yes. Mm -hmm. So that will be happening, and actually the assignments for after school will not come until later in March. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we have also have our first date for kindergarten parents. This is kindergarten parents, guardians only. Uh, we're having um, uh, information session at all of our elementaries on the same day, which is May 8th at 8.30. So they will also get this, this information on an ongoing basis because once they register, then we have their email address. So um, anybody who's listening who's a kindergarten parent, um, beginning January 22nd, you can begin uh, the process. Yes, Mr. Hainer? Have we made a determination or are we postponing on doing a uh, demographic study? Uh, mm -hmm. We. <laughs> We had talked about it and we didn't get any response or for whatever reason. Is that on hold? No. Um, not really. Addressing. I don't know. Would you like to talk to that, Mr. Mason? Yeah. As discussed earlier today in the budget subcommittee mm -hmm. meeting, uh, we're currently working, trying to figure out if UMass the Donahue Institute can actually perform the demographic study. Um, I followed up actually today with the individual to try to start setting up a time again, but he's still waiting on a response from MSBA. Um, and he was waiting for the MSBA to respond, but you know, due to the holidays, they were kind of out of office. So uh, he will get back to us. Thank you. you want to explain why he has to ask? Oh yeah, so the reason why he, he needs to ask the MSBA, sorry I didn't provide this clarification, was because that the MSBA, since Arlington is an awarded town for a new school, um, they're they're doing the work to provide enrollment projections to MSBA. So they're concerned if, if there's a conflict of interest if they do provide the services. Thank you. We have a, a backup vendor that we would go to, but we feel that this is important to do. All right. So um, some really, uh, this, is, this is terrific, this back, um, this last, September, we, we were notified by the Council for International Educational Exchanges that Arlington would be allowed to participate in, in obtaining scholarships for students who wanted to do summer programs. Um, and that they would actually have perhaps as much as $25,000 that they could award in scholarships. We have, the interest was very strong. Um, and we have 15 students that in total have been awarded 20, a little over $24,000 in scholarships 
for four-week programs this summer overseas. The vast majority of them are what they call um, language immersion programs. I'm not sure what the breakdown is in which languages they will be going, which countries or areas they'll be going to for these, but the languages that they could apply for are Spanish, French, Mandarin, German, Italian, Japanese, and Arabic. Mm. So I'll find out who, which one of these students are going where. Um, we also found out in the notification letter that, and I'm, the reason I'm saying this because people who are listening, is that this particular organization still has some scholarship money that is targeted for certain areas that you could still apply for. And they are, um, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Yucatan, Mexico, Alicante, Madrid, Spain, and Seville, Spain. So anybody's listening, there's still an opportunity up until February to apply for those funds. So it's just, it's terrific that our kids are gonna have this wonderful opportunity. Um, another um, issue is the, uh, the census. Uh, we are, um, we have a representative to the town committee for you know, planning for census outreach and we are even going to have an opportunity for some of our seniors if they want to, to have a part-time job this summer and we're working on notifying seniors about that. But the, why I'm mentioning it tonight is it's, I, I think people have to understand how important it is to respond to the sentence, census. The money that Arlington gets, Arlington schools get, mm -hmm. the town of Arlington gets, mm -hmm. is really dependent on what those census numbers are. And so there is, I think I, I've received my own census letter, um, but, the, but the response usually from that requires much more outreach. And this committee in town is working together to figure out best outreach to uh, the community. Can I clarify, this is separate from the Arlington Town Census? Mm -hmm. Yes, I Arlington mean, Town. Federal yeah. census. And federal then when... Census. Well, it's the federal census, mm -hmm. but Arlington... We just got right. the, we just the got, mail, Yes. So oh, oh, oh the yeah. Arlington yeah. You got yes. that yes. one. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, no, no. that's what... That, I that see, one's, see, Yeah, so, and they both say census on it. So. Right. They both say um, census on it, yes. Both are important. Both are important, yes, they are. But the... But for, for the federal, where there is a committee in town working on outreach to make sure that everyone uh, understands the importance of filling that out. And then the other question is just when you say seniors are um, able to apply for a part-time job, do you mean the current seniors or do you mean right? Okay. If they're going to be 18 by a certain date. So that all that information is going out to the seniors okay. in the next day or so. It pays well. Yes. <laughs> um, and the last thing is I, I just want to mention is, you know, we've talked about this before, but I think that given the sort of the climate in our country right now, um, it, it's, it's helpful to also s to mention it now when we don't, we're, if things are fairly quiet and we ha don't have any incidents. But uh, the school department, along with the Human Rights Commission and the Police Department worked together over the summer to, re to develop guidelines for uh, communication and documentation uh, when there are a hate incidents in the schools. And we have been following that protocol um, all year. It's been mentioned in messages when we've had incidents, but I think that given really right now the tenor of the times, it would be important to have this uh, mentioned here tonight, but also for parents to be aware of this MOA. So I'm gonna have a principal send it out in one of the newsletters so that they are aware of that. And we've also been um, circulating among uh, principals as well. You know, just information about, you know, lessons around uh, tolerance that we, it is so important in the, um, the environment in which we're living today, unfortunately. So that concludes it all. Great, thank you. All right, on to the consent agenda. All items are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval, approval of warrant, warrant number 20128-1223-2019 
Total amount 1364853.22. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes 1219 2019, and no trips. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, it's unanimous. Uh, there's no policy to discuss, so we move on to subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Amphi. So budget met this morning. Um, we discussed the current budget. The uh, We're looking at, additionally, we're looking at the reporting mechanisms that we get from the um, administration and how frequent they are and We've solicited um, examples from other districts. We're going to compare those and see if we see anything that we like better. Uh, we did discuss the future enrollment estimation. And then we're also looking at potential improvements for the budget book. Um, as you may remember, a few years back, we started working towards adopting the meritorious budget format with an intent to continue adding to uh, what we did to start with was just to do the format and now we want to start adding more of the data that is expected and so we're going to figure out what specifically it is that we want to add this year um, and we also discussed the audit report that had been mentioned earlier and um, then some interest in um, looking re-examining fees. So. Great, thank you. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schickman. No report. Nothing. Uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. No report. Community relations. Uh, we need to have a meeting. I will send out something soon. Uh, we want to uh, begin discussion of redistricting or continue. Um, options and um, we have a rainbow commission person to appoint. Okay, Ms. Uh, facilities, Mr. Hainer. I will be addressing the uh, Dallin PTO on January 28th uh, with regard to their facilities. Okay, Arlington High School Building Committee we covered. Uh, calendar Committee. Uh, I don't think we have another meeting yet. Is that right? Did we, we don't. I don't. Yeah, we need to get an meeting. We're doing a doodle. I don't know if it went out today or it's going out tomorrow, but. It'll probably be the end of January, early February. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I am having, well, yeah, I'll talk about it later. Uh, but I'm having some liaison reports with the Arlington Human Rights Committee to ask them for help um, in reaching out to people as well. But. Okay. Uh, election Modernization Committee. Next week I have a meeting. Okay. Superintendent search process, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we're working on an RFP for consultant. Uh, we're meeting next Wednesday, January 15th at 5.15 p.m. right here. All right. Uh, nothing on negotiations. Any liaison reports or announcements? Nothing. All right. Future agenda items. Good. The next meeting's pretty full. Yes, Mr. Schiffman. Uh We're in receipt of a letter regarding idling signs. Now, uh, 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 specifically over at the Gibbs. Now, the thing is, as I read the law pertaining to this, it, it, they define school grounds as the adjacent street, but uh, the streets are not ours, they're the town. So that uh, uh, I, we received an email back from uh, uh, the superintendent, I believe, or the administration talking about uh, getting signs in place at our schools in conformance with the state law. If we could just get a report back on that uh, in, in a future meeting. Hmm? Yeah, it's Rachel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Anybody else? All right. Uh, we don't have executive session, so so adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, uh, this unanimous. Has been one of the quickest means.